وقل رب زدني علما الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه يجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك العليم الحكيم يا رب صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم والحبيب الذي ترجى شفاعته لكل حول من الأهوال المقتحة فسهل يا إلهي كل صعب لحرمة سيئ البرار صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم جنبنا الفواحش والمعاصي والخطايا والزلم لا إله إلا أنت بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, Before we begin, just a couple of points um, Firstly, just apologizing for the slight delay in starting um, We always have some issue coming up right at the last second Everything's working fine. And then just as we're supposed to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, something happens. Uh, secondly, Jazakumullah khairan for um, joining this course. Um, Jazakumullah to Mona Hudayfa for arranging this course through siblings of Ilm. Um, inshallah, what we'll be looking at today um, are just a few points regarding Quran translation. Now, when we look at Quran translation, um, sometimes it comes across as uh, something very simple. And generally when students of Ilm do find Quran translation difficult, a lot of times it's to do with the vocab or how to um, arrange the sentence. But what I want to concentrate on today um, are some deeper points of Quranic translation. Um, and inshallah, we'll also be looking at just a couple of points about the differences in um, the translations that we have and what causes those differences in the translation of Quran beyond a choice of words um, and how to understand the vocab. Now, one of the things that I always like to start off with um, is... Generally, in our madaris, um, uh, I'm just giving um, an observation here. So, you know, I, I'm someone from the madrasa myself. I'm, I've been teaching there for over 15 years, and that's why I had the good fortune of you know, teaching on the as well. Um, and so, I, I'm not being negatively, you know, just critical for the sake of it, but it's just an observation, which is that. Generally, in our madaris, more focus is given on hadith and fiqh. And generally speaking, very little focus is given on given on Quran. And this is something that I always try and encourage students of ilm, um, ulama, teachers, and madrasas that you know I have some connection with about this the importance of giving more focus attention to the Quran by having more lessons on teaching the Qur'an. And this ranges from the recitation of the Qur'an, so the tajweed and the qira'ah, all the way to tafsir and tarjim um, al-Qur'an also. So that's the first point. The second point is when we look at the Qur'an, the beginning point should be that this is the word of Allah, who is al-Hakim, which which means Allah is all wise. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being all wise means that every word spoken in the order spoken has a meaning and has a purpose. Famously, we say, hakim la hikmati. That never will a wise person do something without wisdom. Now, if that's applicable to somebody a human being is wise, and that, that is in its full and its kamal with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> and one of the examples I always give about this is that when we're speaking, then we'll have slips of the tongue, uh, we'll say a sentence, and then you might say, you know, actually, let me rephrase that. Because sometimes we end up think, uh, speaking faster than we're thinking. But compare that to when we're writing a CV. We'll write once, we'll look at the draft, we'll write it a second time, we'll write it a third time, 
Sometimes we may end up writing that same CV 10 times. And that final draft that we have, we may have shown it to a couple of people who are experienced um, in looking at CVs or writing CVs. And when that final draft is ready, we are confident about every single word we've chosen, every single uh, punctuation we've chosen, every single full stop, comma, uh, colon, semicolon, everything. So we are confident that this, every single word, is there for a reason. Now with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kalam is exactly that. And that's what we have to understand. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen every single word for a purpose. And this is a beauty of the Quran um, and tafsir. That never will we say, and never can anyone claim that work on the Quran has been done. There's nothing more that we can add. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always open up to people later on that points that he never opened up to people before. And we see this, um, you know, in our lifetime also, where people, mashallah, writing the Quran, come up with points and subtleties of the Quran, which no one had written about before. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing fatah on such people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opening up their minds and their hearts. And that's why it's important for us to, you know, really uh, focus ourselves on the Quran because this is the book for Hibra. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, inshallah, let's make a start. <clears throat> now, um, please don't expect that by the end of these, you know, one and a half hours that we have left that, you know, we'll become masters on translating the Quran. But this is just an introduction about how to understand Quranic translation. Okay. Okay. Let's first of all just look at a um, a history, a brief history of uh, Quran translations in English. Now, the first known Quran translation was done by Alexander Ross, uh, which was printed in 1649. So, good few hundred years ago. Obviously, the English was very different at that time. Um, but two points to be noted about this. Number one that the translation was done by a Christian. And it was for um, the Christians to understand um, about Islam. Secondly, that this translation wasn't a translation from Arabic to English. Rather, this translation by Alexander Ross was based on a French translation of the Quran. So the first known Quran translation in English was taken from a French translation rather than directly from the Arabic. The first translation in English from Arabic was done by George Sale in 1734. So again, approximately 80 years after the first translation appeared. So this was the first translation directly from Arabic into English. But again, this was done by a Christian, by a non-Muslim. The first Muslim translation was done by Mirza Abu al Fadl in 1910. So a long time after the first translation from English to Ar uh, from Arabic to English appeared. The first Muslim translation, uh, now Mirza Abu al Fadl um, wasn't a all of, uh, he wasn't a native English speaker. So that had its drawbacks as it is. The first Muslim translation from a native speaker was done by Mark Magdrick Pickthel in 1930. Now, Pickthel's translation is very famous um, for these reasons that it was among the first translations from Arabic into English by a Muslim from a native speaker. So everything that you needed, or a lot of what you needed, um, was found in that translation at that time. Following this, many more translations have been written and continue to be written. Now, as we'll see, that although Pickthel's translation was and is widely accepted uh, for the reasons that I've uh, given, the drawback of that translation was Pickthel wasn't a master of Arabic. So he wasn't a native Arabic speaker. So his understanding of Arabic was very limited. So although English was brilliant, his understanding of Arabic 
was quite limited. And therefore, that translation also has its drawbacks and its limitations. Now, many, many translations have appeared um, after that. Some have become very famous for various reasons. Um, and translations continue to be written. Now, we've got many more translations that have been written by uh, people well versed both in Arabic and in English, people from um, the Arab world, people from the um, Asian subcontinent, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of these countries with our people, uh, they've written translations uh, into English. And the same would apply for other languages also. So whether it's translations in Urdu, or in Malay, or um, in, in, uh, in Chinese as well, um, in all of these languages, alhamdulillah, we have translations available. Now, inshallah, some of the points I'll be mentioning today um, are applicable to all of these different languages. So the target language doesn't really matter. Okay. Now, <clears throat> one of the fundamental questions is when we do a, quote, translation of the Quran, unquote, is it re a real translation or is it an explanation of the Quran? Because what we really need to start off with is what does a translation mean? So if I'm translating um, for a friend, then do I translate his words only or do, do I translate the meaning that he wants to convey? Now, as we'll see later on, that plays a big part in how we view translations of the Qur'an also. Okay. So can the Qur'an even be translated? Now, um, I, as I do like to make this engaging, um, what do you feel? Do you think the Qur'an can, can be translated? Let's just have a quick um, 30, 40 seconds on this. Okay, so as you as you can see in the um, responses that we've got yeses and noes, and both are correct. The yes is correct, yes is correct, and no is correct as well. And as you'll see, it's because people are looking at this from different perspectives. What are the challenges of translating the Quran? Um, again, let's just have thirty seconds on this. What do you feel are the challenges? of translating the Qur'an. <laughs> Arabic is very fast in finding meanings get lost, selecting the most accurate meaning. The beauty of Arabic language can't be captured. Okay. Various possibilities for Arabic words. Good understanding of the Arabic language. Okay. So some some good responses there. So these are the challenges of translating the Quran. What are the factors which contribute to variances in the translations of the Quran? So We've got so many translations. Are they all equal? Um, the question which everyone asks, and I'm sure someone will ask, um, which is the best translation of the Quran? What makes something the best translation? Um, so inshallah, this is what we'll be looking at on the next slide. The factors which contribute uh, to changes, variances in the translation of the Quran. Now, um, I like to explain this in two ways. Number one, objective reasons or variances, and then subjective reasons or variances and differences in the translations of the Quran. Now, what we must remember is that this list is not exhaustive in any way. There are many, many more 
factors and reasons why there are differences, but I've only mentioned this because of the time limit that we have. <clears throat> and again, my own limitations. Um, there are many things that I haven't understood. And inshallah, you know, I hope that there are these things you will understand that you can contribute uh, to this body of translations of the Quran. Now, what I mean by objective reasons is that it's a yes and no, it's a correct or incorrect um, answer. And subjective reasons are then those reasons which do cause a difference in the translation. Um, however, there's no right or wrong answer. And inshallah, we'll see further what I mean by this. So, one of the objective reasons is difference in contextual approach. Now, I won't speak too much about this because um, this is one of the points I'll be speaking about. Difference in pronoun source. Difference in acceptance of the narration. So the first two points, um, I've got uh, some more slides and examples of this. So inshallah, I'll leave that till those slides. Difference in acceptance of the narration. Now, what's interesting is translation of the Quran is all based on tafsir. And many ayat of the Quran have hadith related to them. It could be the sabab al nuzul It could be to do with an ex <coughs> explanation provided by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of a certain word. Now, many a time what we see is there's a difference of opinion within the muhaddithin regarding the authenticity of a, of a hadith. That implicates the tafsir and therefore that implicates a translation. So those translators that rely on that body and that group of mufassirun who accept the authenticity of a certain narration will use that hadith to explain that word and therefore translate that word. On the other hand, though those translators that follow a different group of mufassirun who don't accept the authenticity of a certain hadith won't base their translation on that tafsir. So as a translator, this is something which will be your responsibility also, but checking the authenticity of a um, hadith. Now, one of the points that I always make to um, the students when teaching this is you must justify every single translation you've given. So if um, you've chosen to accept or not to accept a hadith, then what is your reason behind that? And I'll give you one example about this. When uh, the word waylun comes a number of times in the Quran. Now there's a hadith which says that wail is wadin fi jahannam. And um, those of you that have studied tafsir al jalalain will see that this comes as an explanation of wail um, quite often in tafsir al jalalain So if wail is a wadin fi jahannam, a valley in jahannam, then that becomes um, a proper noun, that becomes a name of a certain valley. Yeah, we see many translations um, that they translate as woe, or they'll translate this as, if I can just ask, ask remind everyone to put off their camera, please. JazakAllah. Um, if many translations uh, have translated this as woe or destruction, um, basically translating this as Halak. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, what is the reason that these translators have chosen not to accept Wadin fi Jahannam and move to something else? So difference in acceptance of veneration, difference in meanings of words. Now, again, those of um, uh, as I have studied Arabic at a deeper level will always come across words which have more than one meaning within the Arabic language. Um, what we call ishtirak um, lafzi. Now, which of those words are we going to use as a meaning intended in the ayah? And what is the reason for that? So we have ayat in the Quran, we have words in the Quran which fall under adhdad. 
Now, adadad, the plural of dhiddun, which means opposite. So in Arabic, you have many words which um, have completely opposite meanings. A very famous one um, is the word qur'un, um, qur'un, jam'u qur'u, and those of you that have studied usul al-shash, usul al-fiqh, again, would have come across this example. Wal-layl idha as'as. Wal-layl idha as'as. But the night. Um, now, the word as'as in Surah Al-Takweer is also from the other dad. So, does this mean wal-layl idha as'as? And, and the night when it arrives, a wal-layl idha aqbal? Or are we going to translate this as wal-layl idha adaba? When the, when the night departs. Because what as'as is from the other dad. So difference in meanings of words. Difference in grammatical analysis. And this is something which we find throughout the entire Quran. And there are literally hundreds of examples that can be given about this. Um, where because different mufassirun have given a different grammatical analysis of a certain ayah, or at the certain position of a word, that greatly impacts the translation. And there are hundreds of examples that can be given about this. Okay. When we come to subjective reasons, now, the above ones, we can say that, okay, this translator or this translation has based uh, their translation on this contextual approach, but that's wrong. And you can give reasons for that. Similarly, the grammatical analysis that... Um, if something is marfu' there are only several reasons why it can be marfu' now it's possible that a translator has misunderstood something and that can be easily seen so that's why I group that under objective reasons that we can't say whether it's right or wrong subjective reasons are also um, are, are those reasons that there's no right or wrong answer but that also greatly impacts how the translation is written. And the first of those is the reason for the translation. That why has this translator even translated the Quran? Are they translating simply to provide the English equivalent or the target language equivalent of Arabic? Are they... Um, writing to bring out the beauty of the Qur'an and the majesty of the Qur'an? What is their reason for translating the Qur'an? And again, think about this in two ways. That if you were um, talking to a group of people, just let's say you're talking to a group of friends and you mentioned an ayah and you give a translation. How would you translate that in comparison to if um, you were asked to write a translation of Surah Yasin. So one's going to be in a book form for a larger audience, and one is just in casual talk, you want to give the basic meaning of an ayah. So the reason for you translating the Quran also greatly impacts how the translation is written. And inshallah, we'll see some examples of this also. The background of the translator that also has a big impact on how the translation is written. Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer. So if we compare, for example, Pictel's translation, Yusuf Ali's translation, look at their background. Um, one was a native English speaker uh, who accepted Islam during his lifetime. One was a born Muslim, but again, not a native Arabic speaker, nor was he a native English speaker. Um, when we go further than that, if we look at um, Abdul Majid Daryabari's translation, a very archaic um, English style of writing, because Abdul Majid Daryabari, uh, very well versed in English, but he he used to read a lot of Shakespeare's works, and he used to actually translate Shakespeare's uh, works into Urdu and Persian. And so that's a style that he's adopted. When we look at Muftaq Uthmani's translation, when we look at Abdul Halim, Professor Abdul Halim's translation, um, we see when we look at Aisha Bulay's translation, 
You see this difference because of the background of the translator themselves. This is, I would say, one of the biggest um, contributors, audience intended by the translator. Now, again, there's no right or wrong answer, but because of the audience intended, that also has an impact on the, uh, the depth that the translator wants to go into, the choice of words, the style of writing, the grammar, the punctuation. And as an example, Professor Abdul Halim, um, who's worked a lot on translating the Quran and his, he's got a lot of academic works on uh, translating the Quran also. One of the, um, what drew him to translating the Quran? So he's a professor at Sawas University in London in the UK. When he, um, uh, in the 80s, um, he was a lecturer at that same university, and he realized that a lot of the non-Muslim academics and lecturers were commenting on the Quran. And he obviously wanted to defend Islam. So he started writing um, translations for some of the ayat and some of the surahs of the Quran. So now, think about the audience that he has in mind. His audience is the non-Muslim academics um, who probably are commenting on the Quran themselves. So that's an audience that he has in mind. When we look at Abdul Majid the Riyabad on al hand, look at the audience that he has in mind. He's somebody who's living in India, although very well versed in English. Um, his interaction is only with um, the people of India. So that's his audience. When we look at Pictham, his audience again was uh, the non-Muslims um, living in the UK. So the target audience um, plays a big part in uh, how the translation is going to be written. And adherence to the original Arabic. That how much should you adhere to the original Arabic? Now, what I mean by this is if the Quran has used a certain order, does the should the translator stick to that order or should the translator use an order which is more prevalent in the target language? If um, a phrase has been used in the Quran, should the phrase be translated as it is? Or should, a, should an equivalent phrase be used in the target language? So how much should we adhere to the original Arabic when translating the Quran? So this is, again, one of the subjective reasons. So these are just some of the um, overall and overarching reasons that why we have differences in the translation of the Quran. Now, <clears throat> let's look at um, context, which um, I put down as the first one. So the context can refer to several things. For example, whether a verse is connected to the preceding verse or the following verse. So whether an ayah is um, starting a new passage or is it part of the previous ayat? And inshallah, I'll show you an example about this also. So that, it's not to do with the vocab of the word, rather it's to do with the context. So the context can refer to this also, the connection um, of the ayah. Whether the verse itself is broken into sections or not. Um, so although we have waqf and stop symbols in our masahif, and these waqf symbols differ from mushaf to mushaf, we can't base our translation on those stop symbols because those stop symbols have been put in by whoever printed that mushaf and based on their understanding. That may not be the um, correct uh, symbol and stop to put. Um, and if I give an example of this also, uh, those of us that use the uh, 13 line mushaf uh, generally printed in the Indian subcontinent and South Africa, um, and we have the, uh, the new juz starting on the left-hand side of the mushaf um, with 
generally written in or it's uh, it's white writing with a back background uh, so that kind of mushaf we have the what we call the rukur now as you would have noticed that in many places the rukur is in the wrong place again because that's just been put there by whoever printed that mushaf there's n there's nothing from the Quran or Hadith to say that this is where you know that section should start to end. So when translating the Quran, we have to consider which ayah is connected to what, what, and which part of the ayah is connected to whether it's before or after it. And number three is what the verse is actually discussing. So the con that also plays a part in the context. So what the ayah is speaking about, what you feel the ayah is speaking about is to do with the context and therefore um, plays a big part in how we translate the Quran. Now, just some uh, writings from the previous ulama about this also. So I'm not going to translate everything word to word. Ahamiyat um, al the importance of the context. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he says, وَأَمَّا تَفْسِيرُهُ بِمُجَرَّدِ مَا يَحْتَمِلْهُ اللَّفْظُ الْمُجَرَّدُ عَنْ سَائِرِ مَا يُبَيُّنُ مَعْنَاهُ فَهَذَا مَنْشُؤُ الْغَلَطِ مِنَ الْغَالِطِينَ Ibn Taymiyyah says that explaining a word بِمُجَرَّدِ مَا يَحْتَمِلْهُ اللَّفْظُ simply based on the apparent meaning of the word عَنْ مُجَرَّدِ عَنْ سَائِرِ مَا يُبَيُّنُ مَعْنَاهُ and ignoring all other contributing factors. This is where we find errors in people who explain the Quran. Ibn Taymiyyah further says, as we see this mistake especially from people who base their understanding of the Quran on possible linguistic meanings of a word. So because a word can mean this in Arabic and it can mean this in Arabic and it it can mean this in Arabic, therefore the tafsir of the ayah is one of these three things. And what they ignore is other contributing factors. And that's why he speaks about siyaq. That what is the siyaq here? What is the context here? That's what you have to look at along with just the linguistic meaning of the word. قال الزرقشيو ما لم يرد فيه نقلون عن المفسرين وهو قليل وطريق التوصل إلى فهمي النظر إلى مفردات الألفاظ من لغة العرب مدلولاتها واستعمالها بحسب السياق. This is a part. That, so Zarakshi says that those ayat where not much has been transmitted from the early mufassirun. Then how we understand this is النظر إلى مفردات الألفاظ. Look at the individual word. ومدلولاتها and its connotations. But along with that, how is that word used in other writings and other speech? And how do we consider the istimal by giving consideration to the context? Zarakshi is saying that this is what he does in there quite a bit. So he's given the linguistic meaning of the word. But then he connects that to what the eye is speaking about and then gives an explanation also. Razi does this quite a bit also. Okay, Imam al Razi, rahimullah, he does this quite a bit also. Um, and lastly, again, Ibn Taymiyyah, um, meaning uh, causes of error. So he says that there are two reasons for this. That last line is extremely important. Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that many people will try and understand the Quran purely based on Arabic, without giving consideration to Al-Mutakallimi bil-Qur'an, the one who spoke the Qur'an, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
والمنزل عليه without giving consideration to who the Quran was revealed to meaning the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam والمخاطب به and without giving consideration to the audience meaning the Muslims and the non-Muslims. So all of this plays a part in the context. So again, when translating the Quran, we must be conscious about all of this also. Now, <clears throat> as an example, مقال الرسول يا ربي إن قوم اتخذوا هذا القرآن مهجورا. Um, now, because this is going to be quite interactive, I will be taking pauses um, because what I want to do is show you some of the translations and some of the tafsir um, from the books of tafsir. So inshallah, I'll be opening Al-Maktab al-Shamila uh, and I'll share that um, on the screen. So there will be some pauses uh, until uh, I open this up. So just bear with me, inshallah, a few seconds. Um, I'm going to be, inshallah, sh sharing something. Um, So many of you may have heard of IslamAwaken.com. It's a brilliant website that you can use uh, for a comparative translation um, of the Quran. Um, <clears throat> so it's called IslamAwaken.com. Um, if you've used it before, then Alhamdulillah. If you haven't, then inshallah, when you go on this page, if you just scroll down to here, the Quran translation pages. Um, and then it's got the different surah there with the different uh, with the ayat numbers. So we'll be going to Surah Al Furqan. And it's ayah number 30 that we're looking at. Okay, so وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Now, in this ayah, I want to concentrate on just وَقَالَ So وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, the meaning of waqal is very simple. Everyone knows waqal yaqulu means to say. Okay? But let's look at some of the translations. <clears throat> so Muhammad Asad, he says, and on that day, the apostle will say, uh, pick the translation and the messenger says, uh, Yusuf Ali, the messenger will say, the clear Quran, the messenger has cried. So a past tense translation, the above three, were future tense translations. Um, Wahidu Din Khan, uh, the messenger will say. Shakir's translation, the messenger cried out. Uh, Bakhtiyar's translation, the messenger said. Um, and as you can see, some are translating as a past tense, while others are translating as the future tense. Now, so we all know what qala yaqulu means, but it's a context here, which is the important part. Um, now, let me just open something else up so it uh, becomes clear. Okay. So this is the uh, Surah Al-Furqan. Here we have waqala al-ladhina la yirajuna liqana at the top. Uh, this is the 13 and mushaf I was referring to uh, for those of you that um, don't use this one. Here, the preceding ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the, um, the day of Qiyamah. Now, in many um, ayat, when speaking about the day of Qiyamah, although this is something which is still going to occur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the past tense, so the Sigat al madi And the reason for this is لِتَحْقِيقِ um, الْوَقُوعِ because of the certainty of its occurrence. So because there is no possibility that Qiyamah won't occur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the past tense as though it's already occurred, meaning this is something destined. So in the preceding ayat, if you see from ayah number 21, Allah says, um, sorry, number, uh, ayah number 22, يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَا بُشْرَ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ that on the day of Qiyamah, when the disbelievers will see the angels, what will they say? What will the conversation be? Um, I'll be coming back to this ayah later on for another reason. Um, and then Allah says, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَىٰ مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلْ إِلَىٰ آخِرُ 
If you look at ayah number 27, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still speaking about that day and the conversation that will take place between different people. And then we come to ayah number 30. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي Now this is where the context comes into it. So some mufassirun of the opinion that this ayah number 30 is connected to the previous ayat. So because the previous ayat are all speaking about the day of Qiyamah, this ayah is also speaking about the day of Qiyamah. That this is a complaint that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa will make on the day of Qiyamah. And therefore we see the translations the messenger will say. On the other hand, Another group of Mufassirun are of the opinion that the discussion of Qiyam ends at ayah number 29. And ayah number 30 is now a new discussion. So it's speaking about the complaint that the Prophet has already made in Makkah al Mukarramah. So a complaint that the Prophet has made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, they translate this as Muqad al Rasul, the messenger cried, the messenger said. So, as we can see, that the, me, the, the translation of or, uh, linguistically is very simple. Qala yaqul, we all know what this means. But the context will change or change the translation depending on whether we connect it to what's uh, preceding this ayah or then what's following this ayah. Now, let me show you this discussion. Um, from Al Maktabat al Shamila, also. So, if you just bear with me uh, about a minute, inshallah. Okay, so this is um, Al Maktabat al Shamila. Uh, many of you would have used this before. Um, it's, it's a brilliant program, and may Allah reward those people that have facilitated, facilitated this. Um, <clears throat> it's made it extremely easy. Um, you don't need you know, a big library at home anymore. Um, so, We've got Surah Al-Fuqan, ayah number 30. So I've clicked here, uh, Al-Kashaf, which is by Imam Al-Makhshari. So he says, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا الرَّسُولُ مُحَمَّدٌ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَلَّمْ وَقَوْمُهُ قُرَيْشٌ Meaning the messenger here is Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, our Nabi صلى الله عليه وسلم, and his people are the Quraysh. حَكَى اللَّهُ عَنْهُ شِكْوَاهُ قَوْمَهُ إِلَيْهِ um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorry, um, Imam Zamakhshari is referring to who is explaining that this complaint is what the Prophet sallallahu made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about his people and then he goes on to explain that this is something very serious that when a Nabi makes a complaint to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about his people, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a'adhaab down. And they are not given any respite. So that's why Imam Zanakhshir is saying that this complaint is very serious. On the other hand, when we look at Tabari's explanation of this ayah, he says, so waqala rasul, we have the ayah there. Waqala rasul, yawma ya'addu al-zalimu ala yadayhi. So, the preceding ayah, that is referring to the day of So, Tabari is saying, the messenger will make the statement on that same day. So, Imam Tabari's opinion is that this ayah is still connected to the discussion about Qiyamah. On the other hand, Zamakhshari, his understanding of the ayah that this is a new discussion. So, this is where the context comes into it. And if I just uh, now, um, inshallah, you you can have this presentation afterwards as well. Um, or oh, well, I'll, 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 I'm going to take that promise back. I'll speak to one of if I see what his um, policy on this is. Um, but if you look at these tafsir kitab, so Tabari's tafsir kitab, Baghawi's tafsir kitab, Zamakhshari's, you'll understand the difference. Um, in their explanations and their understanding. And this is what we have to do as while, while translating the Quran. That we have to try and understand what the Mufassirun have said as well. Look at multiple tafasir before concluding the meaning of an ayah. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi alayhi, he famously said that at times I have read 
to understand one ayah, a hundred different tafasir. A hundred different tafasir to understand one ayah. So if you can't read a hundred, you should be at least reading five or ten before trying to conclude what um, an ayah means. This is a very famous example. Um, this will require a long explanation, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, I will spend approximately a whole lesson on this when I do the full uh, course on the translation of the Quran. Um, but, you know, you can read uh, these tafsir kitabs um, on this ayah if you want to understand the discussion. It's, it's a very lengthy discussion. So, uh, this is an this eye is an example where whether an eye itself is broken up or not. So, talking about Zarikha or Zulaikha, the wife of the minister, and Wahamma has referring to Yusuf. Now, in our 13 and Mus'haf, we have a stop sign symbol uh, or stop symbol after giving the impression that is a sentence. And then وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَرْرَأَ بُرْحَانُ رَبِّهِ is another sentence altogether. Is that exactly what, how the Mufassirun have explained this? No, many Mufassirun have explained this is as وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا as one. So the stop sign should be after وَهَمَّ بِهَا and then لَوْلَا أَرْرَأَ بُرْحَانُ رَبِّهِ that's a new sentence. So the hum that was attributed to um, Zulaikha the same, uh, not level of hum, but a an element of hum was also attributed to Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. And then the, the obviously meanings about, you know, how do we then understand that in relation to him being a Nabi and the Ismat al -Anbiya. Um So there's a very lengthy discussion about this. But how do we translate that? Are we going to translate wa laqad hammat bihi full stop? And then wa hamma biha lawla abu rahana rabbi has one. Because it changes everything. Or do we translate this as Because again, that gives a complete opposite meaning. So <clears throat> there are many more examples. So this is all to do with الانفصال, whether an ayah is connected to what precedes it or what follows it, whether an ayah is broken up within itself or not. So this, when, in relation to context, this is all under اتصال والانفصال. Okay. Um, let's move on. The next thing, um, I just want to give one more example about when I spoke about context, I spoke about whether an eye is connected with before or after it, whether um, an eye is broken up into pieces itself or not. And along with that, what the eye itself is discussing. Um, so if we take for example um, Now Rubba is للتقليل. In Arabic this harf comes to show that something occurs not um, often So seldom does this occur However, there is a possibility of takfir also. And Imam Suyuti rahmatullahi alayhi has discussed the various meanings of uh, Rubama also. However, in this ayah, some Mufassirun event and therefore translators have preferred the takfir meaning over the taqlil meaning. So the taqlil meaning is what's um, prevalent and generally that's what Rubba is there for. But the ayah is talking about the grief and the sorrow of the disbelievers and how they will hope and wish that they had accepted Islam in the dunya. So because this is speaking about something that will occur on the Qiyamah and it's speaking about the grief and the sorrow of the non-Muslims, is that going to occur seldom on the day of Qiyamah or is that going to occur frequently on the Qiyamah? That throughout that day and before the final decision of Jahannam comes, that will they seldomly be hoping that they had become Muslim? Or will they frequently be hoping that they had become Muslim? So because of the condition of the Qiyamah, 
many ulama have preferred the explanation that the ruba mahi is for takthir, not taqlil. So again, that is taking into cons consideration the, the context of what the eye is actually discussing. Um, so like this, there are many other examples as well. Um, and, you know, uh, you can go through some of these and uh, the, the, the full course has, has all of this also. Okay. <clears throat> the next um, objective reason that I mentioned was the the source of the pronoun. So because the source of the pronoun chain oh, has multiple possibilities, the translation is going to change also. So in some verses, the difference in the source of the pronoun will change the translation, but not have any real impact on the message of the ayah, as both meanings are true. As an example, Allah says, الَّذِينَ آتِنَاهُمْ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِّنْهُمْ لَيَكْتُمُونَ الْحَقَّ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ In Surah Al-Baqarah. So Allah says, those to whom we gave the book, يَعْرِفُونَهُ Now, um, if I just show this to you um, from uh, Islam Awakened. Okay, so this is... Um, uh, ayah number 146 of Surah Al-Baqarah So we're looking at يعرفونه here So There's a possibility that this Hu Damir refers to Al-Kitab So not Al-Kitab here But Al-Kitab meaning referring to Al-Quran So those to whom we gave the book Meaning the Tawrah They recognize the Quran uh, this can also refer to Islam, meaning the deen. This can also refer to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we'll see how um, different translators have taken this. So Muhammad Asa's translation, um, they know it. Okay, so it is referring to the book here. He picked that translation, um, recognized this revelation. So here he's clearly uh, explained that he um refers it to the revelation. Um, when we look at Mustafa Khattab's translation, those we have given the scripture recognize this prophet. So he's taken the who Damir to refer to the Prophet. When we come down to Shakir's translation here, those whom we gave the book recognize him. Uh, if we look at TB Irving's translation, those to whom we have given the book recognize it. So it's a translation of it or, or him. However, whether we take it to refer to the Prophet وسلم, so translating as him, or we take it to refer to um, Islam or deen, it doesn't make any difference because all of those are true. So the Ahlul Kitab recognize the Quran and, and Islam and the Prophet وسلم, uh, and they knew this to be true and they knew him to be the true, true prophet also, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is why um, I say that the difference in the source on the pronoun will change, uh, and it will also change the translation, but it doesn't really have any impact on the message of the ayah, as both meanings are true. In other verses, there will be a difference in meaning, although the translation may not greatly change. This is an interesting one. So when we look at Surah to Yusuf, قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِهِ إِلَّا نَبَّأْتُكُمَا بِتَأْوِيلِهِ قَبْلْ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمَا So here I'm referring to the he damir. Okay, so the he damir can either refer to ta'am or it can refer to ru'ya. So if we look at what happened before this, uh, Yusuf alayhi salatu is in the prison. Um, two prisoners have come to speak to him. One says that I see myself pressing wine. The other prisoner says that you know I saw myself in, in the dream, um, birds eating from my head. Yusuf والسلام, then says this. Now, I'm referring to the he damir here. So this he damir is going to be translated as, as it. It can either refer to ta'am, that I will give you the description of the food that you're going to get before it comes to you, 
or it can refer to the ru'ya that I'll give you the explanation of your dream. Again, so I'll give you its explanation. So either way, the translation of the he damin isn't going to change. Um, but the meaning will change because the translation of that we will have to change. So depending on how we understand the maraji' and the source of this damir, the translation of that wheel is going to change. So if we say that um, the he damir is referring to ta'am, we're not going to translate as explanation or interpretation. We'll translate it as description. So Yusuf alayhi salatu salam wanting to tell them that, look, I am a Nabi of Allah. And in order to prove that he's a Nabi of Allah, he's He's, he's telling them that I can even give you the description of the food that's going to come to you before it comes to you. So I can tell you what you're going to eat today. Or Yusuf alayhi salatu salam is saying to them that yes, hold on, I will give you the interpretation of your dream, but there's something else I want to speak to you about first, which is Tawheed. So depending on how uh, we understand the maraji of the he damir, although the he damir's translation won't change, the translation of that wheel will change. And that's why I say that um, there will be a difference in meaning of the overall ayah, although the translation of that dhamir specifically may not change. In other verses, the difference in the source of the pronoun will change the translation as the entire context will be different. Me, I'm talking about the translation of the dhamir itself here. Okay? Um, so in Surah Al-Ra'ad, Allah says, لَهُمْ عَقِّبَاتٌ مِّن بَيْنِ يَدَيْهُمْ مِّن خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُمْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Okay? Um, <clears throat> and let me just show you this, uh, again from Islam Awakened. Here in this ayah, um, Surah Al-Ra'ad, Ayah number 11, لَهُ مُعَقِّبَاتٌ مِّن بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ Although many translators haven't taken this opinion, but there is one opinion that the who damir here refers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, in which case, we'll see the... Um, the capital H on the he here, okay? No, very few translators um, have taken the opinion uh, here. Um, so let me show you this from um, another ayah of the Quran. Okay, so this is Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 24. Ya ayuhal amanu, istajibu lillahi nar rasul idha da'akum lima yuhbikum. So, O oh, believers, respond to Allah and the Messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life. Now, da'a is wahid. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, respond to Allah and the Messenger. So who is the fa'il of da'a? Is the fa'il the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or is the fa'il Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now, yes, we're going to translate as he, Either way, but let's look at the the precision that we need. Okay. Look at Muhammad Asa's translation. Respond to the call of God and the apostle whenever he calls you. Lowercase h. Lowercase h, which means that the fa'il is a Prophet. On the other hand, pick this translation, obey Allah and the Messenger when He calleth you. Here the H is. Uh, in capital. What does that tell you? That according to Pixel, the fa'il is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we see the same in Yusuf Ali's translation. In Mustafa Khattab's translation, it's the lowercase h, Safi Khassas, lowercase h. Um, if we go down further, let's look at um, uh, Muhammad Muftiq Uthmani's translation. Uh, respond to Allah and the Messenger when he a capital H. If we look at uh, the Sahih International Translation, um, when he lowercase h. So again, we have to be very conscious of these things also. That um, there are many examples about this where him or he has been used or have been used, and it's simply a difference between a lowercase h or a capital H, which really is a big difference because you're saying that this is the fa'il is either Allah 
or then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. So these are um, the, the impact that the marji in the damir will have. So the marji is a source of the pronoun. Okay. If we carry on um, with an example. يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ الْمَلَائِكَةَ لَا بُشْرَى يَوْمِئِذٍ لِلْمُجْرِمِينَ وَيَقُولُونَ حِجْرًا مَحْجُودٍ Now this is when I, if you recall when I showed you the 13 and Mus'haf, I said we'll be coming back to this ayah. Okay, for another reason. It's because of the dhamir. <coughs> now, here, um, there's a difference of opinion that, you know, يَقُولُونَ The dhamir in يَقُولُونَ Is that referring to the mujrimin? Or is that referring to the malaika? So yaqulun means they will say. There's no difference about that. Everyone translates. They will say or they will proclaim or they will cry. But it's all to do with speaking and the dhamir is they. The difference, however, is that is the dhamir of yaqulun referring to the mujrimin? Or is it referring to the malaika? Now, depending on the namarja, the translation of hijr and mahjuran is going to change. So hij, the translation of hijr and mahjuran will depend on who you consider the fa'il of yaquruna to be. So if we just look at what some of the mufassirun have said, قال ابن جزي التسهيل لعلوم التنزيل for a concise tafsir, a very, it's, it's a, bit, a bit like jala, tafsir al-jalalain. So he says, وَيَقُولُونَ حِجْرًا مَحْجُورًا الضمير في يقولون إن كان للملائكة فالمعنى أنهم يقولون للمجرمين حجرا محجورا أي حرام عليكم الجنة أو البشرة The ayah reads as يوم يرون الملائكة لا بشرى يوم إذن للمجرمين So the day they, the disbelievers will see the angels لا بشرى يوم إذن للمجرمين on that day there aren't there are no glad tidings for the sinners ويقولون and they will say if we take the ضمير of يقولون to refer to the ملائكة then they are saying to the uh, disbelievers حجرا محجورا and that means you are barred they are barred from what either the بشرى the glad tidings which are going to be given to the Muslims, or then they are barred from Jannah. So, haramun alaykum jannatu aw al bushara. However, when kan al dhamiru lil mujrimin, if the dhamir and the fa'il of yaqulun are the disbelievers, the mujrimin, fal ma'na annahum yaqulun hijran bi ma'na awdan, then it's the disbelievers who are saying hijran mahjuran, and they are saying this as a form of protection, seeking protection from the angels. Li anna al Arab. كانت تتعوذ بهذا الكلمة مما تكره because the Arabs would say حجرا محجورا for any predator for any enemy so when see, when encountering an enemy or encountering um, a predator or any danger they would say حجرا محجورا taking good omen that we want to be protected from this person or this thing so if the فاعل of يقولون um, or the مجرمين then it's they are seeking protection from the malaikat al-adhab, from the angels of punishment. On the other hand, if the fa'il of yaquluna or the malaika, then they are declaring to the disbelievers, the mujrimin, that you are barred from Jannah or you are barred from this, um, these glad tidings. What does Tabari say? He says, يعني أن الملائكة يقولون للمجرمين حجرا محجورا so Tabiri says that the meaning of the eye is that angels are saying this to the Mujrimin. وقال الزجاج والمعنى وتقول الملائكة حجرا محجورا أي حرام حراما محرما عليهم البشرة. وقال الزمخشري وهذه كلمة كانوا يتكلمون بها عند لقاء عدو أو تور أو هجوم نازلة أو نحو ذلك يضعونها موضع الاستعادة. Now the reason I've given this is um, Ibn Juzay, he came much later on, but he gives both opinions. Tabari just explains with one of the opinions. So that means that that's a meaning according to Tabari. Zamakhshari, he gives the other meaning. That according to Zamakhshari, this is a meaning. Now, 
when translating the ayah, which opinion do we go with? Again, we have to make a decision that are we going to consider the fa'il of yaquluna to be the angels, in which case hajj al mahjur will be translated in a certain way. Or are we going to go with what Zamakhshari says? Um, in which case the fa'il are the or the the fa'il are the uh, mujrimin, and therefore the translator hajj al mahjur will change also. Now let's look at this um, from Islam Awakened. Okay, so here we have the ayah يوم يرون الملائكة لا بشرى يوم إذن المجرمين ويقولون حجرا محجورة ayah number 22 of Surah Al-Furqan uh, Muhammad Asa's translation Yet on that day, the day on which they shall see the angels there will be no glad tiding for those who are lost in sin and they will exclaim by a forbidding ban are we from God's grace debarred Now he's actually taken a different approach here his uh, his understanding of this is that this is the disbeliever speaking as a form of regret that we are banned from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the, uh, the the Muslims. Yusuf Ali has made it very clear, the angels will say, there is a barrier forbidden to you altogether, meaning that you are barred from Jannah. Look at Mustafa Khattab's translation. There will be no good news for the wicked. Who will cry? Keep away, away from us. So this is the isti'adah meaning, the ta'awud meaning that Zamakhshari mentioned. So if I just say that Tabari's explanation is the um, the angel speaking and Zamakhshari's explanation is the sinner speaking. Safi uh, Khaskhas, his translation, and the angels guarding Get to paradise will say, stop, stay out. So this is Tabari's meaning. Um, Wahiduddin Khan, and they will cry out, keep away, keep away. This is Zamakhshari's opinion. If we go down to um, the Muhammad Sarwa's translation, rather they will plead to the angels, please keep away from us. Zamakhshari's explanation. If we look at um, Abdul Halim's translations, the angels will say, he's made it very clear here, this is Tabari's opinion, you cannot cross a forbidden barrier. Abdul Majid Dariyabadi's translation, and they will say, away, away. Um, there it's not very clear. Um, it could be, it could refer to both. Uh, if we look at Aisha Bule's translation, they will say, there is an absolute ban. This seems to be Tabari's opinion. Um, now, Hijran Mahjuran, we know it's referring to a ban, so how you phrase that doesn't really matter. The more important discussion here is the fa'il of yaquluna, which will then mean, how do you translate hijran mahjuran? Is this the mujrimin speaking or other? Is it the malaika speaking? Okay, let's carry on, inshallah. <clears throat> um, the third point I want to speak about is huruf al-ma'ani. Now, huruf al-ma'ani, um, are those are basically the huruf? It could be the huruf jarra, could be it could be any other harf. Now, the huruf have a very deep meaning, and one of the mistakes that sometimes we fall into is we we pick a Panzwer dictionary and look at the meaning of a harf or the common meaning of a harf that we know of. And we then apply that to translating an ayah without really giving consideration to the deeper meaning of um, the ahlaf. So one is the depth of that meaning of the ahlaf. And another important element is what we call at-tadmeen. At-tadmeen. Tadmeen is when a harf is inclusive of another harf's meaning. And this has come quite often in the Quran also, okay? Um, but before I go on to that, let me just read what some of the ulama have said. قال سيوطي اعلم أن معرفة ذلك أي حروف المعاني من المهمات المطلوبة لاختلاف مواقعها ولهذا يختلف الكلام والاستنباط بحسبها. So Suyuti, rahmanullah, says that knowing about the ma'ani, and he's discussed this in his kitab al-itqan fi ulum al-Qur'an. So he's got a whole chapter 
on the meaning of the huruf. And it's something that you should definitely study. Um, maybe one of the if I can organize, um, you know, a, a course on the meaning, the deep meanings of the huruf and how they are used in the Quran. It, it's something fascinating. Um, uh, in, in, in the Arab world, they actually, p people write PhD theses on this, the huruf ma'ani. Um, and subhanAllah, you know, the depth of the meaning. Imam Zamakhshirullah, he speaks about this quite a bit. So does Razi, so does Abu Hayyan al-Andalusi in Al-Bahr al Um So, you know, we, ha we have to think about all of this when uh, translating an ayah. قال الزرقشي النوع السابع والأربعون في الكلام عن المفردات من الأدوات أدوات هذه الحروف والبحث عن عن معاني الحروف مما يحتاج إلى المفسر لاختلاف مدلولها ولهذا توزع الكلام على حسب مواقعها توزع الكلام على حسب مواقعها وترجح استعماله في بعض المحال على بعض ب على بعض المجال وعلى بعض بحسب مقتضى الحال وهي سيس هي is that the huruf have their overall meaning, but then because of the madalul and the, again the istikhdam, he's not using the word istikhdam here, Ibn Taymiyyah is the word istikhdam, but it's the same concept. How is the haruf being used? What are the deeper connotations and meaning of this? Ala hasabi mawaqi'aha, based on how it's being used and where it comes in the ayah. Fama fi qawlihi ta'ala, so Zarakshir gives an example. وَإِنَّا أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ So here, um, the, the Qur'an is referring to what people are saying. That, وَإِنَّا أَوْ إِيَّاكُمْ لَعَلَى هُدًا أَوْ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ So هُدًا is guidance and ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ clear error. But when speaking about هُدَى, the Qur'an uses عَلَى. And when speaking about ضَلَال, the Qur'an uses فِي. And go back to the point I mentioned earlier on the first that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hakeem. So the Quran could have said, or the Quran could have equally said, But why does the Quran choose ala for hidayah and fi for dalal? Samakhshali says, فَاسْتُعْمِلَتْ عَلَى فِي جَانِبِ الْحَقِّ the kalima, the harf ala was used when speaking about hidayah, which is the truth. Wa fi, fi janib al batil. And the Quran uses the word fi when speaking about falsehood, meaning um, error and misguidance. Li anna sahib al haqqi, ka annahu musta'lin, yurqibu nazarahu kayfa sha'a, zahiratan lahu al ashya. The reason being is a person who's on truth. It's as though he is overpowering, he is above something. He faces his direction and his glance and his eyes towards anything he wants. He can see everything clearly. Everything is clear to him. So he can see that this is the left, this is the right, this is north, this is east, this is west. And he sees everything. So it's as though he's looking at things from above. Is looking at something from above. الباطل, on the other hand, the person who is in error, it's as though he's um, engrossed and covered in darkness. And therefore he does not he doesn't know which way to turn. Um we always have give the example in battle, people that have upper ground. People of upper ground always have the upper hand because they can see everything clearly. The ones who are on the bottom, um, they are limited in what they can see. So this is the reason the Quran uses ala with hidayah and fi for dalal. So how do we give that depth of the meaning in the language that we're going to translate? Be it Urdu, be it Malay, be it Chinese, be it French, or be it English. How do we give that deep meaning? Of why Allah has been used and why Fi has been used. Let me give an uh, Ma. Okay, so the word Ma comes very often in the Quran. So Ma ta'ti nafiyatan wa stifhamiyatan wa mawsulatan wa mastariyatan. So the word Ma 
comes for multiple meanings in the Quran. It can come to negate something. It can come to question. It can come uh, as a continuation to explain something further. And masdariyat and to convert um, a fa'il into a mustar meaning, to, into a verbal noun meaning. Now, um, I'm I'm just going over this on the assumption that most people attending this are aware uh, of what these terms mean. In Surah Al-Qamar, Allah says, Hikmatun baligatun fama tughni nuzur. Hikmatun baligatun fama tughni an nuzur. An nuzur is a gem of nadir, which means a warner. Aghna yughni means to avail, to come to hand. So Allah says, Hikmatun baligatun fama tughni an nuzur. Now this ma can either be istifhamiya, or it can be nafia. So let's look at what um, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimullah says. Okay? If you just bear with me one minute. Okay. So if you look at the bottom here, uh, this kitab is Zadul Masir. It's a, written by Ibn al-Jawzi rahimullah. It's a brilliant kitab just to understand the uh, the areas of the ikhtilaf. So it's it's uh, organized very good. Um Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimullah, he'll present the ayah, and then he'll just give you a list of the opinions about um, the various possibilities and meanings within the ayah. So it's a very good first kitab to go to, just to know which part of the ayah there's ikhtilaf about, and what are the basic opinions. Um, and then what you can do is go to the more detailed kitabs to uh, see the discussion on those opinions, uh, and then see, you know, which one uh, have been, uh, which opinions have been preferred, and what are the reasons, and so forth. So Ibn Jawzi, um, uh, I, I like this kitab because, you know, it just structures it very well. You've got the simple, okay, there are five opinions, four opinions, three opinions, whatever it is. So here, he says, وَمَا فِي قَوْلِهِ فَمَا تُغْنِ النُّذُرِ جَائِزٌ أَنْ يَكُونَ إِسْتِفْهَامًا وَجَائِزٌ أَنْ يَكُونَ نَفْيًا So Ibn Jawzi says that the ma in Famatun in Nuzur can either be istifham. In terms of rebuking, so it's a rhetorical question. That Famatun in Nuzur, that these people that rejected the Anbiya, what did the, the warnings, how did, it, how did it help them? Meaning it never helped them in any way because they closed their ears and their eyes from listening and understanding and observing what Anbiya was saying to them. It's also possible that the ma is nafia, meaning that the nuzur never came to their avail in any way. Okay. Um, if I just show you this from Tabri also. So here Tabri is saying, وَفِيمَا أَلَّتِي فِي قَوْلِهِ فَمَا تُغْنِ النُّذُرُ وَجْهَانِ أَحَدُهُمَا أَنْ تَكُونَ بِمَعْنَى الْجَحْدِ الْجَحْدِ هي means النَّفِي um, وَالْآخَرْ أَنْ تَكُونَ بِمَعْنَى أَنَّا meaning this is istifham. So Ibn, uh, Ibn Jarir, rahimullah, this is the words that he's used here, الْجَحْد and بِمَعْنَى أَنَّا but it means the same thing that Ibn Jawzi has said. One is a nafi meaning and one is the istifham meaning. So now let's look at this from the translations of the Quran. Okay. 
Okay. <clears throat> so Muhammad S's translation. Um, I, I, we'll just look at the Thamatun and Nuzur. All warnings have been of no avail. So do you think this is the istifham meaning or the nafi meaning? Nafi meaning. Okay, negation, nafi, yes. Okay. Let's look at... Um, Okay, so all of them um, do have the nafi meaning. Are there any translations of the istifa meaning? Um, you can access the Islam Awakened yourself if you want to. Okay, um, it, it, there doesn't seem to be any istifa meaning, although the, the overall meaning of the ayah wouldn't change. Um, because uh, I think somebody just said about Abdul Halim's. Let's look at Abdul Halim's. Abdul Halim's translation. Um, no, even this is a nafi translation. The warnings do not help. Um, so whether we use istifham or nafi, the overall meaning of the ayah won't change because istifham will won't be a sual. It'll be a sual tawbih, which is like a rhetorical question. Um, there are many other ayat with uh, well, that can be presented as examples um, with actual changes and differences in translations. Let's look at this one. لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمْلَتْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُونَ Now, although again, there's not much of a difference in the translation, but let's let's look at this, and then I'll tell you where the ikhtilaf is. Uh, so, Surah Yasin, Ayah number 35. Now, um, again, I just want to show you something here regarding the um, the work and the what we have in our masahif. If I can just open this from uh, our thirteen nine mushaf. Uh, okay, you can see this. So here. Um, if we look at ayah number 35, okay, 
لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمِلَتُ أَيْدِيهِمْ Now here, you know this lam alif symbol that we have in this mushaf. If you read the back of these masahif, they always say that this means that you should continue and you shouldn't stop. So that would give the impression that this should be read and understood as لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمِلَتُ أَيْدِيهِمْ How would you translate that? Anyone? How would we translate this? Anyone want to have a go? So that they may eat from its fruits. Uh, and when I'm to him, the next part. Okay, so if you look at the translation that has been given here, so that they may eat from its fruits whilst their hands have not produced it. Okay, the question comes about why would the Mus'haf then use the Lam Alif? It could yakulu min thamarih. And wa ma'amina to a new sentence about the ma being nafia here. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the gardens of vines. Um, and date palms and we have caused um, springs to gush forth therein and what was the purpose? to eat from its fruits and their hands did not produce it so why is that lamb alif correct? in that place or should it be like a full stop and when we look at the translations when we look at the translations here um, look at Muhammad S's translation so they may eat of the fruit thereof though it was not their hands that made it um, when we look at um, Safi Khaskhas he's done a full stop so that they may eat its fruit it was not their hands that produced it Okay, so this is, this is all the Nafi translation. But look at the study Qur'an. That they may eat of its fruit and of that which their hands have worked. How do you think he's understood the mat to be there? As Mausula. Okay. So one is negating that the hands had any input, and the Mausula is doing Ithbat. It's saying, no, their hands did have input. Um, if we look at Muftiqi Uthmanis, uh, while it was not made by their hands, again, the Nafia translation. Um, The Sahih International, uh, Nafi translation, Abdul Hadim, uh, Nafi translation, Abdul Majd Riyabadi, Nafi translation. So most of most of the translations have taken the Nafi translation, while some have taken the Mosul translation. So now let's look at this from the what some of the Mufassirun have said also. I'll just read from here again. قال الزجاج موضع ما خفض والمعنى ليأكل من ثمره وما مهمة عملة أيديهم. So the judge, رحمه الله, he says that the ما is في موضع الجر. Now what this means that ما is مبني لفظا that there won't be any change uh, in ما. ما will always be read as ما. However, in position, it's in the position of جر because it's doing عطف on ثمره. So ليأكل من ثمره to eat from the fruits. Grown and to eat what their hands produce. It's also possible that the ma is nafia. 
the meaning will then be وَلَمْ تَعْمَلْهُ أَيْدِيهِمْ That their hands had no input whatsoever. Now, um, here, وَكَذَلِكَ وكذلك ابن جرير, sorry, uh, ابن جوزي, he continues, وَكَذَلِكَ ذَكَرَ الْمُفَسِّرُونَ قَوْلَيْنِ That the Mufassirun had given both possibilities. So, even those that say that وَمِمَّا عَمِلَتْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ Like what Zajjaj is saying, that people do have an input because they are physically doing the work. So they are planting the seeds, they are watering it to, to some degree, um, they are looking after the crops on a daily basis. So there is some input. But the Nafi meaning that وَمَا عَمِلَتْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ is talking about the actual growth because that happens on the ground and that happens um, on the branches of the trees. So they have no input in the sweetness of that. They have no input in whether that's actually going to be useful or not useful. So both meanings are true and correct. It's a question of when explaining and therefore when translating, are you going to take a nafi meaning or are you going to take a mosul meaning? And again, um, I always mention that always justify that translation, always justify why. And subhanAllah, you know, um, Hakim al Ummahman wa Ashfari Tanwi rahimahullah, in his tafsir, Bayan al Quran, which is an Urdu tafsir, um, it's brief but detailed at the same time. So it's a call of depth in the meanings. Now, one of the amazing features that he has in this tafsir, that he has a section which he calls Mulhaqat al Tarajamah. So points of the tarjum. So what he'll do is when translating the Quran on that same page, he'll put a footnote. And then you go to the mulhaqat al tarjama and he explains why he's translated that word or the ayah in that way. And then these are the points that he mentions that it's because ma is nafia or ma is mausula or whatever the haraf or the word is referring to. So these points are very useful to understand why the translator has taken that and point. I've not seen anybody else do this in English. Uh, and to be fair, I've not seen or oh, I've not seen anyone do this in English, and I've not seen anybody else do this in Urdu. Um, but again, you know, it's it, to be able to give that to your reader is something amazing. Uh, so you're explaining to your reader why you've translated in that way by simply saying that the ma is nafia here, and it could be because both possibilities are there. It could just be because. I prefer to use Ibn Jadir's tafsir, and therefore he has taken this meaning, and therefore I am following that meaning. Um, so making your objectives clear is um, very, very important, again, while translating the Qur'an. Okay. Now, now we're going to move on to the some of the subjective reasons. Um, so the objective of the uh, translation itself. As a translator, what is your purpose of translating the Quran? Are you simply going to give the English equivalent or are you trying to communicate the message of the Quran? Now, when we look at the, when we do a comparison of the translations, you'll see this great difference within the translations and the translators. Okay, so um, some prefer an easy flow. Some prefer to bring out the beauty and the majesty of the Qur'an. Um, now, Abdul Halim's translation, if you read his translation, it flows very beautifully. It flows extremely beautifully. But again, that's because of the audience. He, he wanted to present a translation of the Qur'an which non-Muslims can read and understand what Islam is about, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the Qur'an. On the other hand, when you compare Sheikh Nuh's translation, which has come out recently over the past few years, couple of years, um, an amazing translation of the Quran, where you can tell that he really focuses on the balagha and the bringing that beauty of the Quran into it. Um, so one word, he won't just translate it with one word. It'll probably be three, four words that he translates it with. Um, and that's why Sheikh Nuh's translation is not an easy translation for a student to follow because you get lost in the translation. Once you've read the tafsir of an ayah, you've understood the nahwa and sarf of the ayah, you've looked at the balagh of the ayah, you've looked at the overall 
uh, purpose of the ayah, then read Sheikh Nur's translation and you'll really appreciate it. Um, so the, it really comes down to, as a translator, your objective of translating the Quran. Um, so how you word or the, word, the your choice of words, your arrangement, all of that makes a big difference. Are you trying to communicate the message of the Quran? So if the ayah is giving a certain message, you might want to give that same message in words, in, in a sentence, which will make it easy easy for the person to understand what the Qur'an is saying. Now, why this is so important is because, and this is something that Professor Abdul Halim speaks about quite extensively and in a lot of detail in his works, which is that when the Qur'an was revealed, it was revealed to um, eloquent Arabic speakers. Um, and we have to understand the context uh, and the culture of the Arabs at that time as well, that they were known for their speech. And that's what they take pride in also. And that's why we non-Arabs, we, we, we call ajam. That people that can't even really speak. Um, I'rab actually is ifsah and ilhar. So that's where Arab has come from. That they are able to express themselves. And that's why they refer to everybody else as ajam. People that don't know how to speak because they can't express themselves. Now, in that expression, they would do a lot of things in the language. So um, iltifat is, is one of those features um, where you've got an ayah, it starts off in the past tense and then it moves to a different tense, where it starts off with a certain conjugation of, let's say, the first person, and then it moves to something else, to a third person, or it starts off with third person and then moves to a first person. You see all those changes. Um, you see that sometimes um, a dhamir has been used um, when a, prop, a, a, a noun should have been used, or we would have used a noun, or a noun has been used when a dhamir could have been used, what we call uh, um, some of you would have come across some of these terms that uh, so for example I say that Zaid visited me and he'll be returning tomorrow. But if I say Zaid came and Zaid will be returning tomorrow, why did I use the word Zaid again instead of a pronoun? So the Quran does this quite often. But this was all because of that's how the Arabs would speak. Um, sometimes there's a question without an answer, a, a, a condition without the consequence. أو قطعت بالأرض أو كل ما به الموت. الله سبحانه وتعالى mentions a شرط that if the Quran, if there was a Quran, سير في الجبال with which mountains would be moved. أو كل ما به الموت. Or the dead would be spoken through, uh, was spoken to through this Quran. So all of this condition, and then the eyes start speaking about something else. The, con the, uh, the condition isn't continued. There's no consequence for that condition mentioned. Now, as a reader, we may say, okay, that's an abrupt ending. But the Arabs fully understood what was meant by it. And that's all to do with the balagha. Um, so how do we, the if our purpose of translating the Quran is to communicate the message, what we may end up doing is adding in brackets or finishing of the sentence and so forth. But if the purpose is simply to give the English equivalent, then you may choose just to stop there. How do you convey the malag? Um, that's also a big question. For example, Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim innaka lamin al Mursaleen. So look at that taqid that takes place in innaka lamin al Mursaleen. That same ayah could have been said, Anta Rasul. It could be, Innaka la Rasul. Innaka Rasul. Why does the Quran employ this uh, structure? Innaka la min al Mursaleen. How do we convey that extra ta'kid that's in? Now, again, it comes back to the audience that if you try and do all of that extra taqid and so forth and bring out the balagha and the beauty. A normal 
uh, non-Muslim that just wants a basic understanding of the Quran, he'll get lost in all of that. He won't fully understand what the Quran is saying. So really, the object of the translation plays a big part in this. Okay, How should metaphors be translated? So if we look at, uh, I'll just give one example. Um, in Surah Yusuf, when the brothers of Sayyidina Yusuf والسلام, are coming with a plan. So they say, Uqtulu Yusuf, awitarahuhu ardan, yakhlu lakum maju abikum. They kill Yusuf or cast him away in a distant land. And what will the result be? Yakhlu lakum wajhu abikum. Yakhlu lakum wajhu abikum. That's a phrase which has been used. Now, the meaning of the ayah is that your father's devotion will be totally yours. You will be, your father will be devoted only to you. But literally means that your father's face will become free for you. How do we translate waj here? Are we going to translate it as face? Or are we going to translate it as devotion? Because that's what the meaning is. So how do we translate these kind of metaphors and these different uses? Okay. What does it mean by That's a supplication that has been made against them. How do we translate that? So the object of the translation will play a big part in this. Um, should the explanation of a word be translated or should the word itself be translated? The word fitna has many meanings in the Quran. Sometimes it comes in the meaning of a test. Sometimes it comes in the meaning of um, adab. Like Allah says, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Here the fitna is referring to adab. Um, Allah says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ أَوْلَادُمْ فِتْنَةً That your assets and your children, your children are mere fitna. Here it doesn't mean adab. It means a test. So, but fitna has its linguistic definition. But it has its, it has its application also. So, how do we translate words like fitna? Do we translate them as fitna, like some translators do? Or do we translate it as a linguistic meaning, a test? Or we, do we give the application, so what the fitna then, we translate it as fear, a punishment. So, darra, um, al ba'sa. Now, if we look at for example, uh, الصابرين في البأساء في الضر... في البأساء والضراء في الضراء والبأساء. Sorry, um, uh, one of the things that you know my students will always tell you that when teaching, I always forget ayat of the Quran. Um, الصابرين في البأساء والضراء. So الضراء and البأساء have the particular linguistic meanings and definitions. But when we look at some of the translations, they'll translate as poverty. Uh, they'll translate as illness, they may translate as disease. That's because they're translating the tafsir of the kalimah. They're translating the application of what, what does it mean by the ra and al -bas. So, is that right or wrong? Well, it depends on the objective of your translation. Um, and really, there's nothing wrong, right or wrong about that. Okay, so this now uh, brings us to the uh, end of today's lesson. Uh, like I said at the beginning, that um, this is just an introduction to understand how we should uh, approach Quran translation and really try to understand some of the differences in translation, the different perspectives. It's not, you know, a course to, um, you know, that after these two hours, everyone will become experts at translating the Quran. Uh, this really requires, you know, years and years of study, uh, Sheikh Nuh's translation that he, uh, the Quran beheld, he worked on that for 15 years. He worked on that translation for 15 years. Um, and it is an amazing translation of the Quran. And even Prof Professor Abdul Halim, if I recall correctly, he worked on his translation for about seven years. Um, so, you know, uh, so even the lessons that we have in Madrasa, you know, inshallah, we do need to try and extend these 
uh, and bring these kind of discussions in that when looking at trans translating ayah, uh, rather than just giving the translation, we need to teach the students how to translate. What should you be considering? What should you be looking out for? So the grammatical analysis is one of those things that I've spoken about. Um, I've not given any examples here, but I just briefly mentioned it. The huruf, the depth of the ma'ani. So what a harf means, why has this harf been used specifically here? Another harf could have been used, but why has this harf been used? Um, when we look at ma, what are the possible different meanings um, of this ma? Which two or three meanings can be used in this ayah? Which one uh, has a better meaning because of the context? So all of those discussions, uh, inshallah, it will really give the students ability to understand how to translate as opposed to simply, you know, bringing back uh, another translation of the Quran that's been done. Um, I hope that today's lesson has been useful in really just understanding the approach that we should take. Um, and uh, inshallah, I hope that, you know, you do take this further um, in whichever way you seem fit. Uh, trying to, you know, look at the Qur'an and the Tafsir, open the books of Tafsir, see what the ulama of Tafsir have said, and then try and understand the uh, the message of the ayah and then the translation of the ayah also. Um, Alhamdulillah, over the years, I've had the opportunity of teaching many different subjects and kitabs. Um, but one thing I always say that I've never found anything more challenging than the translation of the Qur'an. Um, in our madrasa system, we usually study this in the third or fourth year. Um, so somewhere in between. But I've never found anything more challenging than the, uh, the tarjum of the Qur'an because of how deep it can go. Um, Jazakumullah khairan uh, for um, attending the session. Jazakumullah tumul fadayfa and sinu of ilm for arranging the course. Um, are there any questions anybody has?